around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here today, and we greet you. We welcome you today in the most wonderful and lovely name, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I pray today that your cup is running over. I pray that his goodness and mercy is following you daily. I'm certitude, I'm convinced. If you live right, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. That doesn't mean we're not going to have adversity. That doesn't mean we're not going to have tribulation. John 16, 33, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus said you're going to have difficulties. You're going to have times of sorrow, no doubt times of pain, no doubt times of weeping, times of brokenness. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Because Christ overcame, this enables you and I to overcome as well. Now, we know the coming days are going to be adversarial. Satan is going to ratchet up his power, his tools, his implements against the church, the body of Christ. Why? He seeks our demise. He has the hand or the he has the world in his hands. He even offered the world and the kingdoms of the world to Christ. When Adam sinned, he gave Satan the title, the deed to the earth, and Satan has been reigning since then over mankind. I was reading this morning in Isaiah. And there's a day coming, according to Isaiah there in Isaiah chapter 2, that the people around the world are going to enter into a time of peace and tranquility as never before. That will be during the millennial reign of Christ. They will study war no more. Think of that phrase. Actually, it says learn, but it's the same thing in the Hebrew Neither shall they learn war anymore. Yet look around the world right now. Look at the emphasis on military power and might and war. But we're coming into a day when the word of God says they will beat their swords into plowshares. Now, a plowshare back in that day was nothing more than a hoe that they would like you hoe in a garden, H O E how you would hoe in a garden around green beans, corn, or uh, whatever you've planted, okra, whatever, because they didn't have plows uh, in the sense of combines, machinery, et cetera. Uh, No doubt they had bigger plows with oxen, things like that. But what he's saying here is hand tools, basically hand tools. Why? They're going to beat them out. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Cultivation, farming is going to pick up drastically, and their spears into pruning hooks. They're going to take the spears, the pointed part of the spear, and make pruning hooks, a type of knife to prune, as you would prune a tree. This is an age that's coming. (laughs) We're not there yet, and you hear me say that many, many, many times. But it's all coming. We're in the throes of it. It's moving in that direction. And as I said, to get there, it's going to be very difficult. But we rejoice in the fact that there's a day coming when they will study or learn war no more. The possibility exists, I can't say for sure, but I believe just like in the days of Moses, 
when it was a huge matter, Moses would be the judge. The elders, the dukes, God let them be the judge, the elders. Christ will adjudicate all the major elements relative to disputes and differences in the earth during that time. He will be the one. Why? He will have supreme knowledge and understanding. You and I and glorified bodies will also be able to make adjudication on subject matters. Why? Because we will not be mortals. We will be immortal. We will have received glorified bodies. And so everything that you think now, you will not think in the millennial reign of Christ having a glorified body because you will not be carnal. You will be the embodiment of, of, of the Spirit of God coursing, flowing through your veins. So you won't think about the things that you think of now. Sadly, our thoughts many times are terribly carnal, bad thoughts, evil thoughts, hateful thoughts. That will not emanate from within. Why? Because you will have been glorified. Those cravings of lust, of covetousness, of greed, that will not exist. When something is immortal, it has deathlessness in it. It cannot die. It cannot decay. It cannot grow old. It cannot wilt, wither, droop. It, it, it cannot do any of those things. Why? Because it is spiritual. We try to bring this out in the last chapter of the book we've written about eternity. All men will spend eternity somewhere. And when you study the rich man and Lazarus, you find some very profound things in the man's life, especially the rich man after he dies. After he dies, he finds himself in hell. There were three distinct things that I see in the scriptures that he had in hell that he lacked while he was in the temporal life on the earth. Number one, he didn't have any compassion. All Lazarus asked for was the crumbs that fell from his tables. The rich man was a very ostentatious. He fared sumptuously. He lived the fat cat life. I believe Lazarus was also a cripple. I derived at that because the Bible said they laid him at the gate of the rich man. That is synonymous with the cripple that was laid at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful in Acts chapter 3. He was a cripple. And I believe because the wording is synonymous there that Lazarus was a cripple. So in hell, the rich man found compassion. In hell, the rich man began to pray. What did he pray? He said, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger, the pointed part of his finger, dip it in water, touch my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. So he had compassion. He began to pray. And thirdly, he saw the need for repentance. Isn't it amazing? In his previous life, he didn't have any of those things. But hell brought spiritual reality to the man. And he saw the need. He said, I have five brethren or five brothers. If one be raised from the dead and go speak to them, they will repent. Isn't it amazing? and that he saw the need for repentance, repentance. My, 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 it's amazing. He said, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He now saw the significance. He now 
saw the need for repentance, but it was too late. It was too late to repent. That tells me he saw the need in his temporal mortal life, but he didn't respond to it. So in hell, he has compassion. In hell, he prays. In hell, he sees the need for repentance. The compassion was, I got five brothers. He, see, he became a caring man where he was a careless, didn't care about anyone or anything in his previous life. And the tragedy in all of this is both men's lives, Lazarus and the rich man, life is temporal on this side of eternity. But once you walk or cross through the portal of death, death is nothing more than a door. You go into eternity. Lazarus went into eternity, faith in Jesus Christ. He went to heaven. The rich man went into eternity, had no faith. He went into hell. This is not a parable. When the Bible says a certain man, rich man, this, this, this authenticates it's not, a, it's not a parable. It is a reality. It was, it was a, actually a particular individual who Jesus left nameless. But there was a certain beggar and a certain rich man. Jesus didn't name the rich man, but he did name Lazarus. Who was the rich man? Only God knows. So we're coming into a, a stage and a place in the future where men as I said, will beat their swords into plowshares or hoes that they can hoe in a garden and also their spears into pruning hooks where they can prune with a knife whatever they're working on, the kind of tree it might be, etc. You usually top out your okra to keep it growing. You take a knife and you cut the top of the okra plant out, the okra plant out. A little bit of a gardening insight there. But I want to encourage you to hold on today. There's a better day coming. There is a, a better day coming for the redeemed if you hold steadfast to Christ. Let me make mention very quickly here of our revival meeting in America, September the 20th through the 22nd. I want you to come. Enjoy the blessings of the Lord, the fellowship of the Lord. We'll always try to preach the word of the Lord without compromise so that people will be touched and blessed in a very, very significant way. So please put that on your calendar. Drop us a note in the mail or contact us through our website or give us a phone call at 704 538 Eight zero six zero, and say, hey, we're coming. We'll be there and hope to see you. Bring someone with you. Bring a friend. Bring a family member. And we'll be so grateful and thankful for your willingness to help us to know how many is coming in your crowd. We want to go back today to Psalms 37, verse 33. Psalms 37, verse 33, the Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. David is talking about being left into the hands of the wicked. Verse 32, remember we shared from last week, verse 32, the wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Then verse 33, the Lord will not leave him in his hand, the hand of the wicked, nor condemn him when he is judged. The redeemed will be judged 
but not for their sins. They will be judged according to their works. The psalmist David is assuring the children of God that they will not be left into the hands of the enemy. I know sometimes you feel like you're in the crucible. It was in Job chapter 2, verse 6, that Elohim says to Satan concerning Job, he is in thine hand, but save his life. I preached a message many years ago, man in the hands of of Satan. What a horrible and terrible place to be. You'll find that as I said in Job chapter 2, verse 6, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Save his life. Now, Job was not left in perpetuity in the hands of Satan. But he was there for a parenthetical time. That's in essence what David is saying to the child of God. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, the hand of the wicked. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be persecuted and face adversity from the wicked. What we have been witnessing in the last several years is the hand of the wicked as they seek to oppress the righteous. The more godly you are, the more godly you live your life, the more the wicked will seek to encroach, to impede, to hinder, to eviscerate you in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Just like God sees the wicked, and he sees the redeemed, so does Satan observe and see the wicked and see the redeemed because there is a difference in the two. God allowed Job to be placed into the hands of Satan for a parenthetical time. (laughs) Sometimes you find your life in the crucible. As a Christian, as a long-term Christian, you have seen yourself have to go through a valley or valleys. You have gone through times of depression. You've gone through times of anxiety. You've gone through times of discouragement. You have gone through times of failure. But God did not leave you. God cares about you, and he cares about where you are. Why does God allow us to go through these things, you ask? It is to mature you. It is to grow you. It is to make you stronger for the next event, the next scenario that may present itself to you. God is not a hard taskmaster, but God is a God of discipline. How many times in the Old Testament, especially during the Exodus, that God have to restrain himself in dealing with Israel? He got so angry one time, he told Moses, I'm going to kill every one of them, and I'm going to raise up another nation through your loins. And the man of God, so meek, so mild, full of such immeasurable compassion, contrition, humility, reminds Jehovah of his covenant with Abraham. The older I get, the more I see as a Christian how that we truly bear the characteristics and the identity of Christ. 
God gets angry. God has joy. You know, if you don't believe God has joy, remember the parable where Jesus left the 90 and 9 and he went and he found the one lost sheep. He brings it home. He calls his neighbors, his friends. He said, come rejoice with me. The sheep that was lost is now found. We have joy. We have the attributes in our flesh of God. But that becomes spiritual and even more so when you give your life to Christ. The longer you serve God, the more you imitate him, emulate him, the more you become like him. The older you become, you become slower to speak, more swift to hear. You have enough wisdom to mash the pause button and say, I will not react to that matter. I will wait patiently. I will be studious. I will ruminate. I will meditate. I will contemplate. I will debate in my mind, and I will respond the best I can. God doesn't operate on a whim or caprice, and neither will you if you're led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I admonish everyone listening today, you seek to be led by the Holy Ghost. I said you seek to be led by the Holy Ghost of God. This is why you hear me preach about the Holy Ghost so much. He is now the high sheriff in the earth. He administrates the gifts of the Spirit. He administrates prophecies and tongues and interpretation, the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, the gift of faith. It is the Holy Ghost that all of these things operate and happen. And if you have the Holy Ghost of God dwelling in you, you have the opportunity to be used by God in these ways. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can't operate in that. That was when Paul was addressing the gifts of the Spirit to the church at Corinth. I, I hate to say this, but sadly, the gifts of the Spirit have been terribly misused here in this end time hour. There have been things prophesied, things said that were not of the Holy Ghost. They were from the vain thoughts and minds of men. This is what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man... Listen to this, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Let me, let me summarize what he's saying there. You cannot operate, Paul said, in the gifts of the Spirit except it be by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. This is why when Jesus ascended, he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send somebody that will personally live in you. You see, because the Holy Ghost is omnipresent. He can be anywhere, anytime, all the time with people, all of us. He is not limited to time and Space. He is everywhere and he wants to be in your life. No one is able to say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now that's somewhat deep when you really search it out. 
And again, Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit when people say, thus saith the Lord. That cannot be true, that cannot be genuine unless it be in the Holy Ghost. Now, while I'm here, let me just address it a little bit. How many people prophesied Donald Trump would get two terms back to back? But he didn't, did he? So that tells you people were desirous to operate in the Holy Ghost, but they were not operating in the Holy Ghost. The other gentleman that prophesied Trump would get two terms, then Mike Pence would get two terms, and he took that from Luke when the man that found the man on the side of the road, the good Samaritan, he gave the innkeeper two pence and said, when I come back, if I owe you any more, I will pay it then. And so the guy's name was Robin Bullock, made the statement or prophesied supposedly, but it wasn't right. The pence would get two terms. And that's where he got said he got that from. Again, that proved to be error. Yet these people have no accountability. They're, they're, they're never sat down. They're never reprimanded. They're never reproved. They're never rebuked. People like that are just like Hymenaeus and Philetus. Paul said they are making many people to become shipwreck. Because he said the resurrection was not past. But Hymenaeus and Philetus were going around telling people the resurrection has already passed. And they caused people to err. They, they caused people to, to lose out with God. This is why this is so dangerous in this hour. And, and Paul said these false fake words, they are cancerous. They're cancerous. Why? Because they're not of God. If it's not of God, it is cancerous because it's of the evil one. 2 Timothy chapter 2. He starts off there in verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain or worthless babblings. Can I tell you today, a lot of the prophecy that you hear today is worthless babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Listen, Paul is warning Timothy, you're going to see more of this in the last days. And what does it produce? Ungodliness. Not godliness, not righteousness, not holiness, but ungodliness. He says to Timothy, they will increase this faction, this group of, of falsehood, this group of fallacy, this group of heresy, this, this group of mendacities, for they will increase. They will increase. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Paul says to Timothy, for they will increase. Who? These that utter profane and vain babblings. It's just babble. Verse 17, 2 Timothy 2, 17, and their word will eat as doth a canker worm, a canker worm. Can I tell you what the Greek says canker is? Gangrene. And when gangrene gets into one's hands, foot, limb, etc., it, it, it has to be amputated. It has to be cut off because the gangrene will kill. Notice what Paul says. 2 Timothy 2, 17, 
and their word. These vain, worthless babblers, their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. See, these guys operate together. Now watch this. Who concerning the truth, when it comes to the truth, they have erred. They have erred. I know many times I'm overly pointed. You might say somewhat heavy-handed. I do not apologize. I do not back up for that because I see and you see. But are you willing to embrace the truthfulness of what you see and what you witness? I would have so much more respect for those who have prophesied in error and say, I was wrong. But they don't. They don't. Concerning the truth, Paul said they have erred. What were they saying? Where were they in error that the resurrection is past already? Here's the tragedy. And overthrow the faith of some. It grieves my heart, it breaks my spirit that some are being overthrown today by fallacy, by error, by vain babblings, but it is a reality. It is a reality. You know it. I know it. But here's, the, here's, here's what we need to understand. The Word of God will keep you in the right place. This is why Solomon said, lean not to your own understanding. I measure everything by the Word of God. The Word of God is my benchmark. The Word of God has been tested, it has been tried, and it has proven to be accurate throughout all the ages. When I was teaching some months ago on Josiah, 340 years before he was born, a prophet called him by his name. 340 years, three and a half centuries to be correct, three centuries and 40 years, two score, 40 years, four decades, nearly another half century. Who but God could tell you a man's, a child's name that he would be born 340 years and late, and after that he would tear down the statutes and the idols that would be in the house of God that his father and grand and his granddad had established God you know when Isaiah said that God inhabits eternity I don't know that we understand that e- e- eternity is timeless and that's why God who inhabits eternity knows everything from the beginning to the end because God has no beginning and God has no end. So whatever functionality there is in the zillions of years, God knows it all. God knows everything. There is nothing. Oh, hallelujah. There's nothing that God does not know. And God is so divine in his nature, he makes appointments, and this is what will happen at the appointed time. God makes divine appointments. 340 years from now, a child will be born. His name will be Josiah. Here's what he will do. Nobody was alive. Nobody was living that heard that prophecy. Not one. 
No one was alive. But Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, shall he not do it? And hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? Shall he not make it good? I'm telling you, you're going to witness greater, 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 greater deception here in the time of the end. And that is the very reason you need the Holy Ghost of God in your life. As the old cliche is, a stopped clock is right twice a day. Twice a day it's right. I told you the last 15 to 20 years, I said to you, I should use that term, I said to you, God has dealt with me about biblical accuracy, not, not happenstance, not chance, not by coincidence. The, the scriptures are pristine. The scriptures are clear. It is up to us as creatures. We're just a creature we're the highest form of creation. But we're just a creature at the end of the day. The creature should be subject to the creator. But as a creature, you should study and peruse the scriptures profusely so that you do not fall into error because I am holy and I've been convinced of this for nearly 45 years, 46 years. Satan's greatest tool and the time of the end is deception. And the tragedy of deception is you think you're right, but you're totally wrong. Have we not all thought something and we came to find we come to find out we were wrong? We transposed a number, we thought we were absolutely right, but we were wrong. We got into a mess here at the office a few months ago. You have no idea the stuff that I face. I may have shared this. I don't remember now. But we have Time Warner Cable for the ability to disseminate the TV programs, the radio programs to our listeners. High-speed internet. And a manager typed in one wrong number, and our bill is $180 a month. Some months ago, we got a bill for $3,900 and some dollars, and they had added two accounts to our account. They were out-of-state accounts. We have spent innumerable hours. We have at least four or five case numbers, and we can't get it straightened out. They they thought they're right. I know they're wrong because we don't have an account in South Carolina. We live in North Carolina. And you 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 work, you work, you call, you call, you talk to people, get case number, case number, case number, case number. Still haven't gotten it right yet. This is what's going to happen here in the time of the end. But let me also tell you what's going to happen in the end. It's going to be black and white. It's going to be boxcar letters. It's going to be sweet or bitter. It's either going to be holiness or evil. The, the, God is done with this gray area, this in-between area, and you see more and more of that every day about fudging, shading, shadowing the scriptures, the word of God. I see people do it every day. They shade, they shadow Jesus Christ. Oh, I love Jesus. But you pervert, you distort, you twist his word. You don't love Jesus. You honor God with your mouth and with your lips, but your heart is far from God because if your heart was with God, you'd want to do everything that you could and do it perfectly right for the Lord. Not halfway, not dishonest, not trying to pull the wool over somebody's eye, not trying to shade or shadow the word of God. Paul is clear. 
The word of God is clear and telling us how it's going to be in the time of the end relative to false prophecy, false prophecies, evil, bad, worthless, vain, babbling interpretations. This is why I'm not a bivocational preacher. Now, God bless the men that do it, but I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I gave my life to Christ. He called me to preach when I was 12. As I said, when I left the Freightliner Corporation, I took nearly a 75% pay cut. The first year, I made $10,200 some odd dollars. But I made up my mind I was going to be sold out to God. I respect every preacher that says I'm a God called, I'm a God anointed preacher that says I will forsake everything and I will follow Jesus Christ with all of my strength. I'm not saying if you're bivocational, you're an evil person, you're not called of God. I'm just telling you, Peter left his fishing nets. Matthew quit being a tax collector. These men sold out to Jesus Christ. And then early in the birth of the church, you had people in the church saying, hey, you need to take care of the widows. You need to do this. You need to wait on tables. You need to go here. You need to go there. Peter said, oh, no. No, you get you seven men full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Word of God. Let them administrate the affairs of the church, and you leave us, the apostles, the men of God that God has called, you leave us and let us pray and fast and immerse ourselves in the Word of God. Let us spend our lives, our, all of our time, in the Word of God and in prayer. You see, this is what we call divine order. This is why Paul the Apostle established elders in the church. Moses had elders. You see, there's protocol in the church, the body of Christ. It's there for a reason. Every church should have godly men as elders that can administrate the affairs of the church so the man of God can give himself to more time in prayer, more time in the scriptures, more time seeking the Lord. This, 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 this is what it should be. Watch this. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. I, I feel the Holy Ghost when I say full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. See, there's business in the church. It should be run correctly. It should have absolute, utter functionality and not be sullied or soiled in any capacity. Seven men of honest report. I love working with honest men of good report. Full of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. Now watch this, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now that phrase, ministry of the word, is not only you being ministered to by the word, but the word getting in the man of God, and then he ministers that word back unto the people. There are so many things that are out of order in today's modern church. And you know why it's out of order? They've left the word of God and they have forsaken the leadership of the Holy Ghost. I'm preaching. I hope you're receiving. I'm not going to water it down. I'm not going to make it palatable. 
You know, this is why I give you Bible and everything I try to advocate or appropriate. I give you the word of God. This is not my thinking. This is not my ideology. This is not my means, my mode, my method. We're called to preach the word. Was that not what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4? I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. How much word is being preached today? We have thousands upon thousands of churches and television programs and radio programs, but how much Bible is being preached today? You're right. Not much. Not much. Not much. And these little panty waist preachers want to be liked. They, they, want, they want to be embraced. They want people to like them. Listen, if God's hand is on your life, most people will have disdain and contempt for you. I find it amazing. I'm going to preach a little bit today. You let people have a, a tragedy, an aberration, an anomaly, our phones light up. People we've never heard from before in all of our lives. Oh, God, will you pray? Oh, God, will you pray? And they unload on me and my wife. They wouldn't send a penny to this ministry. But when it comes to prayer, when it comes to prayer, oh, they listen, I'm talking two or three o'clock in the morning. Unloading this problem, that problem. See, they don't like you superficially, but let tragedy come and they say, I want to call somebody that can get a prayer answered. And oh, I do pray. Even this morning, I, I can't remember everything, but I do make it a point. God, you've seen every email. You've seen every letter. You know every phone call. You know every husband, every wife, every son, every daughter. You know them all. You see their needs. And I do specifically call their needs. But I'll say it till I die. I can pray for you, but I cannot do your praying for you. Peter said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Acts 2 and 40. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. There are those who contact us who are in prison. I had a guy send me a dollar from prison. A dollar. I thought, he's trying. He's trying. I, did, I didn't expect anything from a prisoner. I wouldn't expect anything. But I'll, he here's a man in prison. One call the other day told my wife, said, I feel the Holy Ghost every time I listen to your husband preach. He said, I got one more year to serve and I'll be out. This ministry touches people's hearts, and I want to say touches people's hearts in the right way. I, I want godly conviction to emanate from this ministry and pervade and permeate and change people's lives. I, I'm not looking for a pat on the back. We all want to hear Jesus say, well done. The other day, a man called the telecast went off. He said, I'm 81 years old. Best preacher I've ever heard in my life. Next guy called said, I'm the sorriest preacher he's ever heard in his life. <laughs> I said, well, I'm blessing somebody. Of course, the other guy was a Democrat. You could tell by the way he talked. Um, so critical of the message. Yeah, you, you, you pray for that former president that's a crook. I thought, they're all crooks at the end of the day. They're not saved. You was a crook before you were saved. You weren't honest before you were saved. I wasn't honest before I was saved. You'd tell a lie. 
Come on now, let's be let's be transparent today. You'd tell a lie. You'd shade the truth. You'd shadow the truth in some capacity, especially when your hive was in the ringer. Oh, I I can't admit that. I, I gotta come up, I gotta wind some yarn for that one, man. That was a big one, but I gotta wind some yarn. Yeah, you could work in a cotton mill, you could wind yarn so well. This is the day, folks. And 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 and, and I'm not being negative here. Listen to me, please, in closing, my time is but gone today. But shun profane and vain babblings, babble, 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 babbling, babblings, for they will increase. Don't expect it to lessen, expect it to increase. As I've said many times, when I first came into the ministry, Quit my job, and I went full-time in 1980. What's that? 44 years ago. You hardly ever heard of a prophet, and when you did, that person was revered, esteemed, and regarded highly. And now they're like grapes and bananas. They come in bunches. And I got the Holy Ghost. I got to Holy Ghost, and I don't get a witness from 98% of the stuff I hear and people send me. Are you criticizing the Holy Ghost? I would never criticize the Holy Ghost, but I will be critical of that which is vain babblings. Folks, we have the scriptures. Paul tells us prophecies are going to fail. Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Bible, the word of Almighty God. 2 Peter 1.21, for the prophecy came in the old time, not by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. My God, we need the Holy Ghost and the fire. Why we need the fire preacher to burn out the dross, to get the slag and the sludge out of your spiritual life, to get you holy, to get you pure, to get you righteous, so that when Jesus comes, he can present you to himself without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Listen, their word will eat as doth Gan green or canker. And he identified Hymenaeus, Philetus. Paul identified Alexander the coppersmith. John identified Diotrephes. He said, Diotrephes, oh, he loves to have preeminence among the people. Look at me. He showboated, obviously. But John warned of Diotrephes. These men marked Korah. They, they, they said, hey, listen, these aren't what you think they are. We've got, we have got to get disciplined to our discipleship in Jesus Christ. It's imperative. I, I cannot overly emphasize the need of walking in paths of righteousness with God Almighty. Walk with him. Walk with him. Listen. Living right, I mean living right. I'm not talking about some half-baked cake. I'm talking about living right. Living right and preaching the word of God without compromise has never been popular. It never will be popular. It was so unpopular with the political crowd, it cost John the Baptist his life. It cost Jesus his life. It cost Paul his life. These governments killed these people because of their Christianity, because they preached the truth. Think of what John the Baptist did. He told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. My God, 
If John the Baptist was here today, they would also behead him because he would tell all of these politicians and all of these preachers and all of these, what you're doing is not right. It's wrong. It's not right. Kill him. Kill him. One of the early theologians in the church I read and I shared this years ago with you, how that Herodias, when Salome brought John the Baptist's head on a charger, a wooden platter, Herodias pulled out his tongue and stuck a big needle or dagger through it. She was saying, I got your head cut off and I'm piercing your tongue. She may have done that to that poor man's head, but she did not negate the truthfulness and the validity and the veracity of the word of God, and she knows it now. If she did not get right with God, she knows now what John the Baptist preached was righteousness. These men were not cowards. They didn't, it didn't matter who they were standing before. They just told the truth. They just, they just told the truth. Paul was a little bit more diplomatic when he stood before Felix. You know, Paul was a, <laughs> a better educated man, of course, than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he lived out there in the wilderness. But John the Baptist was beheaded, and Paul stood before Felix, and he preached three fundamentals to Felix and his wife, Drusilla. What did he preach? Righteousness, temperance, and judgment. You find that in Acts chapter 24. You might say Paul was a little bit more eloquent but he preached righteousness. You must live right. Felix Drusilla, you must live right. He preached temperance. He, temperance is about the works of the flesh. And thirdly, he preached judgment. Judgment. You're going to stand before God in the day of judgment. That's what he was saying. And they too did. History, has, history records that Felix took his life, committed suicide. He died a suicide. Yet he said to Paul, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. A more convenient season. We don't know that he ever saw that convenient season or time, but history says he took his life. Live a godly life, my friend. So you hear Jesus say, well done, in the end. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.